I wanted to say uh, welcome, and I've been talking to a few of you, and I, how exciting it is to see that you're a lot of from, from Southern California um, that made the trip up here all night long on the bus. Yeah, can I see a raise of hands of the people? That, oh my God. Can we have a round of applause for them, please? <laughs> So my name is Marco Angulo. I'm a family medicine doctor. And uh, it's something that, it's my second career. Actually, I was a professional musician from the age of 18 to 26, playing rock and roll in Hollywood. Um, I decided that to go back to community college. I'm a, a product of community college, East LA College. Who's from community college? <laughs> my peeps. <laughs> And uh, I transferred to UC Berkeley as a Chicano Studies major. After Chicano Studies or UC Berkeley? <laughs> Go Bears. We're playing UCLA today, so. <sighs> um, so after that, I, I went to medical school. It's something that I've wanted to do ever since I went to East LA College because I wanted to serve in the Latino community. I wanted to serve the community that I grew up in. And for me, that was a huge uh, passion. And uh, my thing was, making sure that I, follow, I, I took baby steps along the way. And it wasn't um, the most perfect pathway, but I ended up going to UC Irvine, the Prime LC program in medical education for the Latino community. And it's medical school. I don't know if you guys heard of that program? Prime. prime, yeah. So all the UCs have a prime program, and we have a prime LC in Irvine. It's called for the Latino community. It's developing professional physicians to serve in underserved areas, and Irvine is the, for the Latino community. Um, it was, for me, the dream program because I was a Chicano Studies major, and it fit exactly with, with what I wanted to do. We actually have a table here today if you guys want to come stop by. I'll be around with the table, and you can meet our, our faculty and staff as well. Um, and after that, I stayed on, and I'm part of the residency program in Prime, and right now, we are developing and creating uh, hopefully the largest volunteer program in Southern California, in Orange County, to make sure that you guys, or our volunteers, get experience, clinical experience, they get to be with patients, they get to be leaders in the community, and also they do research. So all our volunteers are, we have them do research to make sure that they take that next step. And all our volunteers right now are all pre-med. So, uh, and we have a good ratio of people going we're right now 100% with people going from our volunteer program, then the next step is getting into medical school. We have a ratio, good ratio because they're such stellar students and they go right into medical school, so it's something kind of neat to see. Um, as far as medicine's concerned, it has been the greatest thing I've ever done in my entire life. It really has. There's ups and downs, but let me tell you, when you walk in, when you knock on a patient's door and you think of your family members, you think of your, your tios, my tios, my tias, my parents, and I think I could go ahead and be really rushed with them, or I can go ahead and make sure that they're comfortable, they're treated, they're treated with the utmost respect, and for me, that's a big joy with every single one of my patients. So when I knock on the door, I always relive all those times, all those memories that I have of my family members growing up, and you walk in and you're like, ah, Senora Sanchez, como esta? You know, so especially if they're getting better, like if they're diabetic and their hemoglobin A1C is dropping, you know, you're like, ah, los globos, and you have the balloons come down. And so it's a big celebration. And for me, it has been the greatest thing that I've ever done. And uh, like I was talking to someone, I think um, it's something that, it's something new every day, every day. You think like, okay, I figured this out, and all of a sudden somebody comes in with something, you're like, wow, learn something new every day. And I think the most difficult part wasn't so much medical school. For me, it was pre-med. How many pre-meds are here today? Wow, okay. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and we'll get to the talk. Um, but before I said that, I just wanted to ask you guys, or think about it, because it's kind of a big group. And uh, think about, when you think about what a pre-med, when somebody comes into your class, sits next to you, and says, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I'm a pre-med. Oh. There you go, sir. Look at that. Hello? Check, check. The better? Oh, there you go. Awesome. 
Um, so when somebody thinks about, I'm a pre-med, what, what things come into your mind? You know, I always ask this question, except, of course, I don't expect you guys to answer right now because it's such a big group, but I'll tell you guys what I get. First things I get when, we, when, when I've given this talk before, I get like, oh, very studious, very astute, you know, very organized then, you know. And I get a lot of positive things about a pre-med student. You know, imagine yourself sitting next to a pre-med. A lot of you are pre-meds yourself. And then you start getting the real answers when you, when you sit there and they're like, well, you know, type A personality. Well, you know, kind of not sharing their notes. Um, cutthroat, uh, you know, intimidating. You know, so after a while you start asking these questions, the first part is very positive and then it ends up going toward the other part. And it's something that um, being a pre-med is, that's, that's the name of the game. And I, I think, could you guys agree with me a little bit? Okay, so you walk into that room and you go through this pre-med process you feel like if you've been put through a, a mill, right? A razor blade of a mill. Every, the guy next to you, the guy in front of you, in fact, the teachers will tell you, person left, person right, you're probably not gonna see him in the class. You know, this is like a, a weeding out course. You've heard that weeding out course before? Okay, then you get into medical school. So you go to medical school and it's a rigorous process as well. It's not easy. And then you graduate from medical school and you become this kind, compassionate, warm-hearted person. When does that happen, you know? When does that happen? When you go from a cutthroat environment to like a rigorous environment in medical school, which they don't, they try their best to teach you that humanity part of it. But believe me, you know, it, it doesn't happen in medical school. And then you're supposed to be this altruistic, kind, caring person. It starts a long time ago. It starts when you, when you were born, growing up as a child. It starts from growing up with your upbringing. And a lot of times, it gets lost along the way because you're like, I have to fit this mold of this, this um, you know, pre-med cutthroat mentality. And for us, it's very difficult to see when people get weeded out. And I'm like, oh my god, this person would have been just the most amazing physician the most amazing doctor, and they're like, nah, it's not for me, you know? And you start thinking about why, why, what happened? I just didn't like the cutthroat mentality, the cutthroat environment, you know? For me, that breaks my heart. It does, because I think we're losing a lot of great doctors, especially now if we have the Affordable Care Act, and you see all the commercials now, sign up with our insurance, sign up with, have you guys seen those already? Well, they're, they're happening, so if you turn on TV, they're happening now. For me, it's exciting times, because a lot of my patients that didn't have insurance are gonna have insurance. So we're, gonna, we're, we're in need for a lot of physicians. So let's get to this right here. I'm also, I've been doing this for 15 years, meeting with students one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I, I, I would say easily over 1,000 students. One-on-one -on -one personal, sit down, create their pathway, make sure it's comfortable for them. It's not a one-size-fits-all ever, ever. A lot of times today you'll hear Oh, just follow this and that'll get you to medical school. You know, it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. And I'm also, I've also been on the UCI admissions committee. So I've also been on the other side, admitting people into medical school. And after you're on the other side, you realize, wow, this pre-med stuff isn't as difficult as everybody makes it out to be. You know, so it's, it's actually, there's, there's patterns to this. And there's, there's it's an, it's a, it's, a complex, it's made into a complex thing because of all of us around us. And oh, I heard this, but I heard th the dean over here on this panel said to do this, 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 and you're like, oh, I'm screwed, you know? I mean, is that not right? So we always think undergraduate, you go to undergraduate, community college to a four-year university, boom, straight to, straight to medical school, four years, boom. A lot of times, our pathways are like this. Actually, the majority of the time, our pathways are like this. And even in admissions, the majority of the time, our, our, the pathways are like that. And for some reason, in our minds, we have that, oh, we have to go straight in. If not, there's something wrong. It's like we're walking this tightrope of perfection. And we're moving along, and we're like, if I just, if I, if I get that B minus or that B plus, 
that's, I'm ruined. You know, I have to have, you'll hear it a lot today. You have to have a 3.5 or above or don't even bother applying. Have you guys heard that or no? Is that out the door now? Yeah? Not everyone takes the same, same trip. And that's something to, to really realize. Some of the things, what I'm going to talk about is, I would say, the five or six most common things out of meeting with those thousand students that I've been hearing over and over again that's very powerful as a pre-med, or a pre-health student, even if you're going to pharmacy, even if you're going into dental, same thing. So feeling, the, the, this feeling of falling behind is extremely powerful. This is probably the number one. This feeling that you're sitting next to this person and then this other person says, well, last night I got home late because I'm, I'm uh, shadowing a neurosurgeon. We had a late surgery and my research project is due uh, for tomorrow to get published. And I also studied for organic chemistry and I, got, I think I got everything down. But, and then you're sitting there going, oh my God. <laughs> I haven't even shadowed. I, haven't, I, I barely got this OCHEM stuff down, right? So this is something, it's very powerful because, or what, I've, I've been in a room when I meet with a student, I'm like, okay, this is your plan. It's like a boom, 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 looks great. You know, the student actually is the one that developed the plan. For me, I think it looks fantastic. They step out of the room and go to their class and they meet a person next, next to them and all of a sudden come back and like, I changed my whole plan. That's it. Because I'm, I'm gonna be studying an MCB, I'm gonna be doing this and I'm thinking like, Everything is, make sure it's tailored toward yourself, you know, and the, the most powerful thing is comparing to others. And I think uh, we, we do it all the time. Once you let go of that and say, that's good for you, and you kind of look at, but this is my plan, things start to fall in line big time. So this is from the, uh, the AAMC, the Associate of American Medical Colleges, is where you apply to medical school. This is, a, uh, you could actually go to their website and see this on their website. So this is a four-year template of how to get into medical school. Join freshman science and related clubs. Take general chemistry with lab. Take calculus. Start thinking about your summer plans. Get exposure to healthcare fields uh, like hospital or clinic and get into a research lab. Sophomore year, this is what you're supposed to be doing. I hope you guys are doing this. Take organic chemistry, take biology, start thinking about your major, continue volunteering at a hospital, continue with research. Take a now you're a leader in the, in the club that you're doing. Meet with your advisors and discuss your program, possibly take summer school if you need to take any courses, and in summer, get a job. It's important to learn what it's like to have responsibility for your job. This is cut and paste from the AAMC. I didn't make, I didn't add or, or, or include anything on this. So you guys want to see junior year? All right. Take physics and biochemistry. Attend college fairs and pre presentations from recruiters, which you guys are here today. Good job. Um, continue leadership with pre-med clubs. Continue research, clinical experience, participate in pre-med conferences. Ta-da! Check, right? Uh, contact getting information from school. Start making decisions about the type of medical school you want to attend. MCAT. Take the MCAT exam. Meet with your advisors. Ask him or her when recommendations are due. Request letters of rec. Visit schools in the summer. You apply to medical school. And then your fourth year, a lot easier. Take physiology, anatomy, finish up with the requirements, go with the interviews for med school while you're taking all those courses. Get accepted to medical school, prepare for graduation, and in the summer, relax. <laughs> okay. I mean, if this fits for you, I applaud you, you know? Look, I'm getting a little twitch back in my eye right now that I just went through that. That's, so what I wanna, what I wanna share with you right now, let me just take a little swig, uh, is a real life um, example of a student that we worked with, um, one second. That was um, a, a Berkeley student, a UC Berkeley student. And they came in, sat with them, and they wanted to, they were pre-med students. They wanted to be Calculus One, G, Chem, and English. Their first freshman year, they got a D in Calculus, they got a C in Chemistry, and they got a B in English. 
So second year, they're like, okay, that's it. I didn't do well in my calculus one class. My calculus two class, since I know all the information, the calculus was so fresh in my head, I'm gonna double up. Double up is always a bad idea, let me tell you right now. But she was like, I'm gonna double up so I'm not feeling behind. Because all her friends were going on and she didn't wanna feel behind. And then she took GChem too, which she got a C in. So, she got a C in Calculus 1. Great, she passed. She got a D in Calculus 2, and in GChem she got an F. Second part. Freaking out. She wanted to be a doctor with all her heart. Summer. Calculus 2 and GChem 2. C minus and D. Now, I don't know if you know this, but medical schools don't accept C minuses. You have to retake the course. So the fall, she said, I'm going to really try hard. I'm going to really do it this time. And she took Calculus 2, GChem 2, and OChem because she did not want to be behind. She thought that was it. C, C, and F. I'm not making this transcript up. And this is with her, with her permission that, she, that I shared this with. English, I mean spring. English 2, Political Science 101, Intro to History. What happened? She bounced. She said, medicine is not for me. This person would have been a great doctor. True story. I'm, I get choked up when I see this because I know her pathway. I know her story. And it just, you know, I mean, and it's not just her story. There's so many others that have gone in that pathway. There's so many others. I mean, if you're blowing by, acing everything, continue to do that. You're going great, you know. Sometimes, though, it's ups and downs happen, sometimes life happens. There, for her, there was a lot of things going on. She had a job, she was uh, what, you know, helping out with home. It's, it, was, it wasn't a good time for her to do it. So here's another one, conceding defeat. So I'm not doing so well in my science course right now. It's so competitive, that's okay. I'm gonna be doing a post back anyways, a sophomore UC student. So a post back is like afterward, when you decide to, when you, if you either want to bump up your, your GPA or if you're a, a career changer, you would do a post back program. For her, she was like, I'm gonna be taking these science courses anyways. I'm gonna probably get season M, but who cares? You know, at this point right now, know in your academics when you have to hit the reset button. And when things maybe, if they're not going correctly, if something's happening in your life, it's okay to hit pause. Medical school is not going to go away. Pharmacy school is not going to go away. Dental school is not going to go away. It's going to be there. It's been here since the 1600s. Harvard was here for the 1600s, right? It is not going away. It's going to be there. So when you apply, whether it's this year, next year, the following year, you have to be comfortable saying, I'm going. I'm going to go. I'm going to be a doctor. What year? I don't know, but I'm going to do this, you know? Okay, choosing a major. I chose biochemistry as my major so I could stand out in medical school. I'm a double major in science and Spanish to be a more competitively eligible med school applicant. Some of the things you'll hear today, I'm hoping, is that whatever you major in, that's for you. That's what you love to do. As far as the admissions committee is concerned, we look at it and it's a one second, oh, that's interesting, let's move on. It's not like, if, even if a triple major, I'm like, oh look, triple majored. Anyways, let's go on to see what they did. <laughs> but when I was a pre-med, when we were going through this, it was like, oh, I'm a double major in this and this, and so they can kind of, it's not weighed as much as you think it is. And sometimes, if the major's working out for you and you love to do it, then go for it. If it's not working out for you and you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole because you feel like, well, it's the pre-med thing to do, 
then I would reevaluate and I would do what you love to do. I got this information told to me early on, and that's why I chose to be a Chicano Studies major at UC Berkeley, because I loved what I was doing there. I loved learning about my community because I knew I was going to practice it when I was a physician. Still took my pre-med courses and did decent in those to end up later on going to medical school. So you have to find a plan that works for you. And there's actually, not all pre-med counselors are created equal. So there's something that I wanted to real quickly let you guys know about in my career. Just wanted to make sure we're not running out of time. Good. Um, when I was in East LA College, what's the first thing you do when you decide to go and you decide to be a pre-med? Back in the day, the first thing for us to do was to go talk to your pre-med counselor, right? Kind of get a plan going, everything like that. And I remember walking to Dr. Chan's office. She was the pre-med counselor at the time at, at uh, East LA College and saying, Dr. Chan, I want to be a doctor. I want to serve the Latino community. I want to do this. I want to, you know, I was, I was on fire that day, right? She's like, well, I don't know. It's tough. I don't know if you're going to make it. And then she asked me, she goes, do you have a girlfriend? I go, yeah. She goes, oh, you got to get rid of her. <laughs> I honestly walked out of that room. I walked out of her office, and I was in a daze. It's like, there goes my dreams. Well, I guess maybe I'll try x-ray technician. Maybe I'll, you know, all these things are going into your head. Like, maybe I could do this and that. And then I ended up being a, um, a closet pre-med. Do you guys know what a closet pre-med is? <laughs> closet pre-med is someone that we sit in the back of the room, we, take, we have like our calculus book and everything like that, and then when somebody says you're a pre-med, you're like, mm-mm. <laughs> you're doing the biology and the chemistry, and everybody's like, oh, I'm pre-med over here. You're like, I'm not. <laughs> but you're doing it in case all of a sudden you come out and you're like, ta-da, guess what? I'm in medical school now. You know, it, believe me, though, it doesn't work like that. You know, after I, I think the, the changing moment in my life, and this is something you guys should absolutely try today, I would in highly encourage it. When I wrote my name up on big letters in the chalkboard, Marco Angulo, MD, and I repeated that to myself, Marco Angulo, MD, is that going to happen? And at first, it was like I couldn't do it. Whew, this is it's too much respect for the MD, the profession. I don't want to be there, you know. You're a community college student at the time, you're thinking like, oh, there's no way. I'm just a community college student, right? But when you write it, oh my God. You're like, that's it. When I went to Berkeley, I stuck it on my door. Yeah, the doctor's in. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it was so empowering. I, I, if it's a PhD, put a PhD. Put MD, PhD. You know? I say get used to it. Start thinking it. Start living it. You know, it's something that's really important. The other thing is, not all pre-med counselors are the same. This is what Dr. Chan taught me. Dr. Chan taught me that I don't want to go back to her anymore, <laughs> right? She is what I classify as a gatekeeper. She, a gatekeeper is a person, and you may meet them here. Very nice people. Don't ever tell them they're gatekeepers, though. <laughs> um, they, they actually want to save you from yourself. They, they're like, well, you know, I, I, don't, I want to save you this heartache that you're going to be taking later on and this disappointment that you're going to be doing later on, so I, I'm going to stop you right here. And then they'll put the kibosh on your dreams. And then that's it. That's what they do. That's their specialty. Unless you're a 4.0 student, you got, like, you know, all these things going on, and then they'll be like, oh, well, let's, let's, you'll, you'll do fine, you know? The next one is the cheerleader. So there's an there's advisor, the cheerleader, and sometimes we need the cheerleaders. Our parents are the best cheerleaders, you know? You can do it, you can do it, you can do it. I don't know how you're going to do it, but you can do it, <laughs> you know? You've had those before, right? We've all had them. We need them sometimes. You know, oh, my God, I got a D on this exam. Don't worry, it's going to be fine. You're going to do better next time. Hey, that's important at times, right? But it's not giving you that much advice later on, right? And then this is the big one. And this is something that if you find this person, you hold on to this person at all times. This is a coach. A coach is someone that sits with you and you say, guess what? I failed this class. It's okay. 
take some time to sulk. Let's plan of attack is, and let's, let's sit down and see what we can do about this. And you say, but my medical dream's over. No, it's not. No, it's not. Let's figure this out. That's a coach. And sometimes they'll give you some tough love, too. Sometimes they'll be like, you know what? <laughs> Let me tell you about this, this, this. But here is the plan. And they always leave you with a plan that you and that coach work on together. So this is another one, extracurricular overload. If only medical school could accept me for my passion in serving the underserved and not just my grades. Oh, if they only they could see how much I have in my heart, even though I'm seeing, 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 you know, getting C's across, across the board. Uh, this, is, this is actually the foundation that I always give to students when I meet with them in my volunteer program. First and foremost, if you don't have well-being, if you don't have family, finances, relationship all together, it's all crumbling. You have to have a good foundation. Grades and academics are next. And the last, last, last is your extracurricular activities. And sometimes I've seen people turn this pyramid around. And they get so involved in extracurricular activities because that's instant gratification. Hey, I went to the Flying Samaritans. I know I had an exam coming up, but I'm not doing it in the class anyways. But I went over here and just to make, you know, it made me feel so good. You know, knowing where your limits are, knowing where your foundation is, I think is the most important thing. So grades matter in admissions, but not for the reasons that you may think they matter. So this is something that we always saw in the admissions committee. And I'm going to give you guys a little insights on some of the, the discussions we've had in admissions. Oh. So uh, before I go on to the next slide, it's always about what have you done for me lately? What, how are you doing now? For us, that tells us, are you OK to start? If somebody starts really strong, and all of a sudden they start tapering off, it's never a, this person got dumber. Never like that. It's always like, something, something's going on. Something's going on here in this person's life that they're not ready yet to go to medical school. Is medical school out of the question? Absolutely not. But they have to correct this, because just imagine them coming down and then entering medical school. And you guys have heard it, right? Medical school is like a fire hydrant. You put your mouth over it, turn it on, and all the information comes, right? <laughs> That's what it's like. So are you ready with your study skills, with your family, with your fight? You know, everything's ready to go. Are you ready to get that shot, you know? That's huge, because we've seen people just like the one that I showed you earlier. Afterward, what she did, and I'll tell you real quick, she actually went out and did a post back at Hayward, you know, did, did her classes there, got really strong, uh, did a po uh, post back program, and then when she applied to medical school, it was a non-issue. It's like, big deal, so what? She did, didn't do so well in the first couple years, but guess what, she figured it out. And sure, in medical school, man, surgery's tough to get into, let me tell you, so she figured it out. Financial aid. Uh, I've managed to keep my school debt down by working and going to school full time. My grades have suffered a bit, but, but at least I don't have to worry about paying my, any loans back. So loan is not the new four letter word. It's actually, you have to realize if working, if you're working, so then if you were, when I was going to UC Berkeley, I was, if I was working, the person next to me on the left and right, all they were doing was studying organic chemistry, you know? So keep that in mind. It's an investment in yourself. It's actually a really good investment in yourself. And now they have all these new loan repayment things, you know? So and the government has a new loan repayment thing. It was called income-based repayment. Okay. Family. I'm the oldest and the first in my family to go to college. My parents depend on me for a lot. I can't let them down. I just can't. You know, family may not understand the rigors of being a pre-med student. Being selfish may be the most giving thing you do at this time, with your time. You know, now I get called constantly with my mom, mijo. You know, and she'll like ask me like, you know, what do you think? My doctor said this, and I, I, I coach her through the process. I'm like, well, ask him this, ask him that, you know. But for me, it was, it, once again, when I was at Berkeley, when I was at, at uh, 
East LA College. He was like, Mom, I'm not gonna be talking to you this weekend because I have a huge exam on Monday, so I'll talk to you a little bit afterward, you know? And after telling, letting her know like three or four times, she finally started understanding. Letters of recommendation. I need how many letters of rec for med school? I knew I should have gone to more office hours. Now what do I do? <laughs> this is actually the big one. So the first one being behind, and this one is huge. Uh, letters of rec, I'm telling you right now, and I don't, don't want to scare you, but for medical school, they're a lot. They're huge. Because you can work on your application to the bone, to the T. You can actually, you know, I would say, you know, advise, get advice from someone. Even they have like the Encarta that you pay $4,000 and they work on your app with you and stuff like that. But for a letter of rec, Encarta's not going to write that letter of rec for you. You know, this is something for us that we see that they actually, you know, speaking about who you are as a person that you have no control over. Well, actually, you do. And, oh, yeah. Do you know that the worst time to ask a professor for a letter of rec is right after taking his or her class? So you've aced the class. Straight A's. You got, you're in the top 99 percentile. And you go up to him and say, Professor so-and-so, um, I'd like a letter of rec from, if it's okay for medical school. Do you know that's one of the worst letters of rec you're going to get? I want you to think about it. And you know why? It's going to be the shortest letter of your life. And we see them all the time. We used to call them Berkeley letters. Sorry, Cal. <laughs> it's this person is in my class. They were in the 99th percentile of the class. And they got an A. I recommend them for medical school. I, on transcripts, we're going like, yeah, they got an A. All right. But that's it. That's, that's all we see of them. Is, for me, it tells me nothing. It's a waste of paper. So in a class of 300 people, how do we possibly build a relationship with our professors? How can we absolutely do that? And it's not an excuse, and you're gonna, and I used to hate hearing this, because I was, when I went to Berkeley, it was like the classes were 300, UCLA has them too. Um, how do you, you know, it's so big, don't you understand that it's very difficult to get a letter of rec? Here is four steps in building that relationship with that professor. One, go to office hours. Office hours are huge. You know why? Because they will tell you the answers to tests that are coming up. Do you realize that? I used to sit next to a physiologist, and she's like, he, he was like, you know, I give them the answers of what I want in my test all the time in office hours, but they don't realize it. So the people that go to office hours, they're going to score big, right? Also, it eliminates things when you're studying. So then, professor, what about, you talked about this. Ah, don't worry about that. Don't have to worry about it anymore, right? <laughs> and then, and then another perk from that, then after that, you actually hear somebody else ask a question, and you're like, oh. Did not realize that, right? And then guess what? That question ends up being on the test. And you're like, oh my God. So piecing all the information together. Make an appointment uh, with that professor afterward. Uh, ask yourself, is this person who I see myself building a relationship with as a mentor? And then continue discussions after that, updating them on your progress. So this is what I mean. Start your dream team. Your dream team is something that you create on your own. So right now, you guys have pens and pencils out, or papers out. I want you guys to write down three people, three people that have impacted you in your life. One of them has to be a professor you've taken a course from that, has said, that you've said, wow, that person really charged me up. That person really got me excited. I want you to write these three names down. Take two seconds. Doing okay with time. I want you guys to really do this. Even if you were sitting in the 300th seat, but that professor did something for you and taught you old chem and just did, oh my God, everything just opened up, I want you to put that there, his or her name down.
Today, yes. Please, please. If they impacted you earlier on in college, please write them. Absolutely. Yeah, even if you're like, I haven't talked to that person or seen that person in two years, write their name down if they've impacted you. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. Somebody from the community, some, but at least one. At least one. Today, after the conference, after this conference, I want you to send them an email telling them how much they've affected your life. I don't want you to worry about letters of recommendation. I don't want you to even think about, oh, I hope this guy responds because then we can have coffee and I can get a letter of rec. No, you are just sending out an email to someone that touched you in your life, that really motivated you, and send them an email just quick, and it doesn't have to be anything big. I have an example of an email that was sent out. Is that okay? Don't expect anything in return, just send it. You'll be surprised at what you get back. You, that three people on your dream team, that should be hopefully by the end of this month, 20 people, 20 people. And you keep building that because nobody that's going to pharmacy school, dental school, medical school does this alone. Nobody does this alone. Here's a sample email. Dear Professor Jacobs, my name is Anabel Arroyo, and I took your course in biochemistry two semesters ago. I never got a chance to thank you for teaching the course. I have to admit that your course was one of the most challenging I've taken, but it really pushed me to think outside the box of memorizing it and made me critically think. I'm sure as a future physician, I will be using the tools you taught me to serve my future patients. Thank you once again. Sincerely, Anabel Arroyo. Sent that out. She was not expecting anything in return. He sent back an email saying, wow, I had no idea that anybody felt like that about my course. I thought people were sleeping in it. <laughs> and they went out for coffee, and now he's supporting her on a letter of recommendation for medical school. It, that, that wasn't the point. She sent out 15 of them, just as an appreciation. A lot of people, she just has been really constantly, it's a dream team, it's her dream team. She has to keep them up. And I think for us, we see this as letters of recommendation. Oh my God, I gotta get one. And then a professor smiles at you and you're like, oh, they noticed that I'm here, oh my God, that's gold. I gotta get in, I gotta get in, you know. I've been there, believe me, I know it. It's like a token, you know. I mean, some of the things like, and I'm talking to students, they're like, yeah, uh, I took general chemistry my first year of, uh, of, uh, at Cal. And I got a letter of rec from that person, and then now I'm applying five years or four years later, and then like, well, have you talked to that person yet? No, but I got a letter of rec, and it's inside the, uh, you know, the letter of rec service. And I'm like, but that's like a five, four-year letter that, yeah, but I got it. You know, that's not the point. The point is you want people to know who you are. And I'll tell you, one of the best letters I've ever seen in, in admissions process, and I'm going to change the name, it's like, Pam is my hero. The reason why Pam is my hero, and it went on to talk about Pam's life and how she, you know, he, he knew her like the back of his hand. And I was like, how could you develop a, a relationship with this professor at Berkeley? You know what I mean? That, that's huge because it's a, it's a, you know, that class is 300 people. How did this person get to know this person? Well, she must have put him on his dream team. And for us, and I've written a lot of letters of recommendation, I honestly, when somebody goes to medical school, when somebody goes to dental school, I take that as like, oh, we all got in, ah. you know I mean? You take it personal, you like, wow, that's a team, we did it, you know? And you, you do, you take that pride. And you're like, oh, yes, another one, let's go, you know? <laughs> you have to keep them updated, um, email updates. And I used to email update um, my professors every six months. There's this person, I don't know if, uh, in Berkeley, his name's called uh, Dr. Frische, and he's an organic chemistry uh, teacher. Um, he's still on my dream team because he taught me OCHEM so well that I still email him uh, every six months. <laughs> he never responds. I don't care, you know? <laughs> Honestly, I don't care. I mean, there's going to be one of these, I tell them, I go, hey, now I'm here now. If you ever need anything, if you have any students that are coming around the way, don't, you know, I'm here for you. 
since you did this for me, you know? And he doesn't respond, but one of these days he might say, hey, I got a student for you that I really, you know, truly believe and they want to go to Irvine. It's not, that'd be great. I'd love to help him out, you know? Continue updating your team through personal meetings. A cup of coffee is always great. There's a Starbucks in every corner. <laughs> At the end of the day, they will not only be letter writers, but mentors for life. And once again, you don't do this alone. You really don't do this alone. So the closet pre-med thing doesn't work out. So you've probably already started your training and you probably don't even know it. Now, the last thing I wanna leave you guys with is this. A lot of us that are here today, now as physicians, as medical students, we know what you guys go through. We really do. We know the rigors of being pre-med. We know what it's like to get up in the morning, take a deep breath and say, is this gonna happen for me? Is this gonna happen? Am I wasting my time? I've had many, many memories of that. Look in the mirror, you say, should I just put all the chips in now or take them out or what? We also know what it feels like to have family members, either one or the other, say, oh, you know, time, you know, you, you, you're not married yet, you don't have kids, you know, what, what are you gonna do now? I'm getting old, I need my doctor and my family, you know. Or you have the other one where your family doesn't even care and they're not even supportive. They're like, I don't know what you're doing, but it seems like you're wasting a lot of time. We also know what it feels like to get back an exam, read it, and have your heart sink from here down to the bottom of your stomach and say, there goes my career. Know what it feels like. And we also know what it feels like to get an MCAT score, click on that button, comes out, and you're like, there, go, there it goes. There goes my career. We know what that feels like. You have to understand this, and I'm gonna leave you with this. You have to understand that we've all gone through this pathway, thousands and thousands and thousands of us, and we're here to hopefully reach out, help you through this process. We're here to make sure that you know that the water's great on the other side. Let me tell you, the water's fantastic on the other side. And you will meet doctors, you will meet doctors that say, I don't know, yeah, I wouldn't do it, or go over again, this and that. You know, I wouldn't do it if I were you. Let them know that, once again, let them know that you say, well, well this is what I always say. Are you gonna serve the Latino community? Are you gonna serve the underserved? Because I gotta be there, you know? You're not doing this, I gotta do this. And it's usually people not in the community saying that. It has been the greatest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I'm so blessed to be there. I love my patients, I really do. Today I want you guys to consider yourselves MS zeros. So MS1 is first year medical student, MS2 is second year medical student, MS3 is third year medical student, MS4 is fourth year. You are now MS zeros. You're already there. Thank you. <laughs>